My mother's kitchen is a miracle working spot, a place of transformation. Here, a handful of rice, a pinch of turmeric, and a splash of fresh lemon juice are magically transformed into mouth-watering lemon rice. A slice of cucumber and tomato with a sprinkle of salt and pepper becomes a tangy relish. This special place not only brings about change in food, but in people, too. But like all changes, it can sometimes be painful. For being such an enchanting place, the kitchen is actually very ordinary. It consists of two rooms connected by an open doorway. The first room has three pieces of furniture, all large and made of wood. There's a long teak table with measuring cups and milk strainers on it. The china cabinet occupies another wall filled with pieces of fine china, as well as stainless steel pots and pans. Against yet another wall is a large cupboard with a mesh covering. I love to open this door and take whiffs of the buttery tang of yogurt and the biting aroma of dried chilies. The second part of the kitchen is where the cooking takes place. A large open fire hearth occupies most of the room. The cooking hearth is made of river clay, and every few weeks, Debbie walks to the riverbank and brings back a plastic bucket filled with moist red clay. She uses this clay to mend any cracks and smooth the edges of the open fireplace. On the wall opposite the cooking fireplace, there's a window with a wide ledge where ripening tomatoes, mangoes, and other seasonal fruits and vegetables stand in a row here, as attentive as soldiers on parade. Baskets of pungent onions and garlic, impossibly perfect red potatoes, orange flesh yams and long tubers sit in a corner. Bunches of red chilies, garlic and herbs hang from the low wooden beams and their fragrance add pungency to the already aromatic kitchen. There are several low stools and a bench placed in front of the window. This special kitchen and my home or on a hilltop in the outskirts of the town of Mahagiri in South India. The house, with its red tiled roof and smooth whitewashed walls, is surrounded by tea bushes. From my backyard, the hillside look like they've been carpeted in green. As the first fingers of dawn light up the sky, the kitchen comes alive with the rich aromas of cooking and the cacophony of sounds. During the cool, foggy evenings, the kitchen is warm and cozy. Twilight has come and gone. The cows bedded down, and the only sounds in the still kitchen are the voices of Mother and Debbie, idly gossiping about the day's events. A few embers glow in the fireplace, and my mother rests her aching back against the warm hearth. I join her, loving the comfort of her sturdy body. The peace is shattered by somebody hammering on the wooden doors. I'm almost asleep on my mother's lap, lulled by her soft voice, and I sit up, startled, blinking the sleep out of my eyes. Debbie, our housekeeper, and my mother walk to the door. Stay in here, my mother says in a firm voice over her shoulder to me as she walks through the open doorway to unlatch the door. Who's there? Debbie asks, her mouth through the crack of the door. Please, Devi sister, open the door, says a pleading voice. It's me, Kashi. Kashi, mother exclaims. She unlocks the door and pulls it open. What's going on? I can't resist peeking out and almost yell in surprise when I see Kashi tumble into my mother's arms. Her face is bruised and one eyelid is swollen and closed tight. Come in the kitchen. My mother leads an exhausted Kashi inside. Mina, get up and pull out the mat from behind the door. I run to do as I'm asked, and soon Kashi is curled up on the bamboo mat. Kashi looks very different from her usual smiling self. She's the daughter of our cowhand, Bojan, and during the weekday she takes care of me and helps Debbie in the kitchen with light chores. But now, her round face with smiling dimples is drawn and thin, and her lips look like they would never smile again. They're so swollen and red. 
a cut on the corner of her mouth is leaking a stream of blood. Devi pushes me aside to kneel beside the girl and wipes her face with a rag dipped in warm water. My mother is rummaging in a wooden box for her first aid supplies when there's another violent banging on the kitchen door. Mother turns with a questioning look at Kashi, who tries to sit up. She looks frightened and her voice is all shaky. It's him, little mother. Don't let him take me away. My mother gets up and lays a reassuring hand on Kashi's forehead. Lie back down and don't worry. I won't let anyone take you away. She doesn't ask Kashi any more questions. She strides to the door and flings it open. Her back faces me and I can see she holds herself so straight and stiff that she looks taller than her five feet. What's the meaning of this racket, she asks in a cold voice. Is this the time to come knocking on a door and waking up a woman and her five-year-old child? I peer around the kitchen wall and through the half-open doorway and see a group of men. Bojan is in front of them, his face apologetic in the dim light. There are five men behind him with flashlights, and one carries a stout stick. Bojan steps toward my mother. Little mother, I'm sorry to cause you such worry, he says in a careful and polite voice. All the villagers and our neighbors call my mother Little Mother as a sign of respect. Her real name is Sudha Lakshmi. Tell her to return the girl, a voice shouts from behind him. Bojan turns and motions for the speaker to be quiet. Please, Little Mother, my daughter has come with us, has to come with us. She has shamed me and my family and needs to be punished. My mother draws herself up taller, and although I can't see her expression, I know her lips are probably drawn in anger and her black eyes flashing in temper. Bojan, you know better than to come knocking on the door at this time of night. Yes, your 15-year-old daughter is with me and she stays here until she's better. Have you seen how she looks with a swollen face and black eye? But little mother, you don't understand, Bojan says when he's rudely interrupted by a man's voice. Let me up front, he says. He pushes Bojan aside. He's tall with a thick woolen scarf wrapped around his head, and he looks like a giant next to my petite mother. His eyes are bloodshot, and his big mustache quivers every time he yells. His voice is loud, and I wince when he steps closer to my mother. This girl is mine. Give her to me. My mother does not step back from his belligerent face. Oh, and who are you? I know Bojan is her father, but what right do you have here? That girl is promised to me. I agreed to the marriage, and just today, I caught her with another man. I demand she come with me. I know what to do with such girls. Bojan steps up to my mother in front of the aggressive stranger. Little mother, this is Thimban. He's engaged to my daughter. She has disgraced him and my family. My mother looks over her shoulder and sees me peering around the corner, and then she looks back at Bojan and Thimban. If I agree to listen to your complaint tomorrow, will you leave me and my daughter alone tonight? We have to come back tomorrow, Thimban asks. I don't know. If you take the girl right now and something happens to her, I will make sure you regret it for the rest of your life. The chief constable is a friend. Now, it's late, and I think you should all go back to bed and sleep off your toddy drink. She stops Bojan's protest with an impatient gesture. I can smell the alcohol on your breath, so go home before you all do something you'll regret. I'll meet with you here tomorrow morning. You give me your word that I can take the girl tomorrow? Simban asks. My mother shakes her head. I said, I will listen to you, and we can decide on a course of action. Bojan pushes Thimban aside and says, Little mother, thank you. We'll come back tomorrow. Grumbling a little, the men turn around and leave. Thimban turns back as if he wants to say something, but Bojan pulls him away. He knows that my mother will keep her word, for he respects and trusts her. 
My mother closes the door, bolts it, and leans on it for a moment with her eyes closed. She then walks over to Kashi and pulls up a low wooden stool. She sits down and takes one of Kashi's small hands in her own. I scoot along on the floor and come to rest beside my mother. The blood has been cleaned off Kashi's face. Devi applies an herbal ointment on her cheek and swollen chin. Devi warms some milk with honey for Kashi and make up the spare mattress so she can sleep on the floor in my room. Also, bring a couple of aspirins from my room. Devi goes to light the small kerosene stove and places an aluminum saucepan with milk on the blue flame. She walks out of the room through the back door, avoiding the front door, which is now bolted and locked. My mother turns back to Kashi. Now, Kashi, I need to hear from you what happened. Then you can drink the milk and take some medicine for the pain. I want you to rest, but I need to hear what happened. Oh, little mother, it's all my fault. Kashi wails, tears streaming from beneath her puffy eyelids. I know my father wanted me to marry old Thimban, but every time I'm near the well or by myself, he tries to grab me. I hate his hot, smelly breath. A few weeks ago, he tried to stop me while I was on my way here. I was surprised and screamed so loud that Raman, who was nearby, came over to help. When Thimban saw him, he went away, cursing Raman. I was so grateful to Raman that I took him a bowl of my sweet rice payasam. He was by himself in the house and was so nice to me that I sat down and talked to him. Tonight I was going to his house with some leftover rice when Thimban came out from behind a tree and asked me where I was going. I tried to run away, but he grabbed me and said all kinds of bad things about me. When he slapped my face, I fell down. Then he tried to reach for me, but I hit him on the head with a rice bowl and ran away as fast as I could. I have nowhere to go, so I came here. Kashi, what were you thinking, my mother sighs. I know it's hard to understand, but your father did what he thought was best for you. Kashi cries quietly. I feel sorry for her. She looks so sad and worn down like the puppy dog my mother found on the side of the road after a truck hit it. I don't know what to do. I wanted to ask for your help, but I knew everyone would be angry with me. Please help me. My mother is quiet for such a long time that we can hear the pan of milk sizzle and the hoot of an owl outside. Mina, turn off the stove, she tells me. Kashi, I'll try my best to help you. Do you want to marry this Raman? Kashi's tears stop. She tries to sit up, and the eye that's not swollen is filled with happy tears. You'll help me? I don't want to marry anyone right now. Just then, Devi comes in with a jar of eucalyptus honey. Soon, Kashi is sipping the hot milk and honey. We walk across our tiny courtyard to the bedroom and I watch my mother tuck Kashi in and speak to her in a low, reassuring tone. I can't hear what she says, even though I strain my ears. Come, Miss Big Ears, my mother tweaks my ears. You've heard more than what's good for you tonight. It's way past your bedtime, Mina Cuddy. I wake up next morning and lie in bed for a moment, thinking of everything that happened the night before. I lean over to see if Kashi is still in bed, but the mattress is neatly rolled up and pushed to the side. I hop out of bed. I hope I'm not too late for the meeting. <laughs> the morning is a busy time in the kitchen with the cow hands bringing in pails of fresh milk. My mother and Aya strain the milk to pour it into big tin cans ready to be delivered. Everyone wants to buy milk from our cows because our milk is never watered down. Little mother, we're ready for the clean milk can, says Bojan. My mother is definitely in charge of our cows and tells the cow hands when to milk the cows and how to take care of them. Today my wife will be here to help in the vegetable garden, Bojan tells my mother as he collects the milk cans. That's good because we need the help, Bojan. It's past time to plant the tomatoes. 
have people from the village come and help plant her garden. We grow potatoes, beans, cabbage, and carrots in neat rows. The kitchen gets crowded with people and animals. Our three cats and dog try to force their way into the room and beg for a taste of the fresh milk. My mother always feeds them. I walk in, and my mother looks up and smiles. It's my sleepy head. Go oh, get something to drink. Kashi is in there. She gestures with her head toward the kitchen. Kashi sits on the floor, shelling sweet peas. I dip into the bowl of green peas. I pop the fresh sweet peas into my mouth. Kashi stops me before I grab another handful. Stop that, little one. Your mother has some warm milk for you right by the fireplace. She gets up and brings me a steel tumbler of warm milk. I sneak another hand of peas. I watch Kashi as she sits back down. Her face is still puffy and looks lopsided, and her lips are raw and chapped. I feel sorry for her again. What's going to happen to you? I ask. She shrugs her shoulders and sighs. Her mother has promised to take care of me, and I know she'll take care of me. Did you have a meeting yet? Yes. It was scary to see Thimbun again, but I sat next to your mother and I didn't look at him. He was yelling and screaming, but your mother invited the chief constable. When he arrived, everyone was much quieter. I couldn't listen to everything because I was so nervous. Will you have to marry Thimbun? No. Your mother said I could live here. When I turn 17, she said, she'll arrange my marriage. Until then, I don't have to marry anyone. Kashi smiles, and even with her discolored lip and bruised face, she looks like the old Kashi I know. I smile back. I'm happy she won't have to marry an old man with smelly breath. When you get married, I'll ask Mother to make you some lemon rice for the wedding feast, I say to Kashi, who giggles and ha gives me a handful of peas. I knew my mother would take care of Kashi. I take a sip of sweet milk and look around the smoke-darkened kitchen walls. I love this place with its warmth and its rich aromas of spices and cooking. There's no place like it.